All right. Hello, everyone. Hope this video thing works. We're going to try to continue with our song. I hope this thing goes right. It's doing something weird. But we sang one verse already. So I guess we'll sing verse 2 of 437. Tell me the story of Jesus. If you missed it, well, apologize for that. Verse 2. Let me get the let me get it going first. Fasting alone in the desert, tell of the days that are past. How for our sins he was tempted, yet was triumphant and last. Tell of the years of his labor. Despised and reflected, homeless, rejected, and poor. the story of Jesus, cried on my heart every word. Tell me the story most precious, sweetest that ever was heard. Tell of the cross where they nailed him, writhing in anguish and pain. Tell of the grave where they laid him, tell how he liveth again. Love is a story so tender, clearer than ever I see. Let me weep while you whisper, love is a ransom for me. Tell me the story of Jesus, right on my heart every word. Tell me the story most precious, sweetest that ever was heard. Amen. <clears throat> and then we'll sing page 428, I think. In the garden. <clears throat> I come to the garden Stay in the garden with him, 
page 446 for in just a minute and uh, uh, we'll sing here in just a little bit uh, but uh, first I want to encourage everyone to keep praying for each other and for everybody and uh, uh, remember tonight is Wednesday and so if you have any prayer requests give them to me or post them or anything um, and we'd appreciate that and we'll be able to pray for everybody and um, make sure, remember, you give in your tithes and offerings and, and all that as well. We haven't updated the board, <laughs> um, though we do have some already. And, and so, all right, let's get our hymn of uh, fine page 446. And we will try to sing Redeemed. Redeemed, how I love to proclaim it. To proclaim it, reading by the blood of the Lamb, reading through His infinite mercy, His joy forever I am. Reading, reading, reading by the blood of the Lamb, reading,
and verse 39 is our text main text and then we're going to switch over to mark chapter uh, 12 and so you can be in mark chapter 12 that's where we're really going to get uh, um, more um, uh, get into the scriptures more okay but uh, john 5 verse 39 All right, John 5, verse 39. I believe this is uh, part two of my message that I started last Wednesday on search the scriptures. And uh, and there's a great need to search the scriptures. And, uh, and so verse 39, Jesus said, search the scriptures, for in them you think you have eternal life. And they are they which testify of me. And uh, so we want to to use that verse. And uh, uh, of course, uh, last week um, we we found out or talked about how that um, uh, we need to know the scriptures, uh, but we we must go to the right source to find the truth. And uh, and the scriptures are that source, and that's what we learned last week. Uh, we talked about there, and then but this week. We want to talk about you must know who you're dealing with okay and uh, in this passage jesus had to deal with a bunch of rough uh, folks all right and uh, uh and so but he he said search the scriptures for in them ye think ye have eternal life you think you've got heaven you think you've got eternity settled you think you've found the answers have you have you found the answers if you haven't, if you don't know for sure, you need to search the scriptures. Okay, let's pray and ask the Lord to join us tonight. Our dear Father, pray that you join us and uh, enter into our service. And uh, Everyone that uh, is listening or hears this, may you uh, cover them with your blood and protect them and give everyone uh, open ears and eyes and that we may hear and see and that the word of God may come alive to us. I pray that you would... Uh, Help me, Lord, as I try to preach this message tonight and bless those who are listening. May the word of God uh, do something in them. And we'll thank you for it. We ask in Jesus' name. Amen. Mm -hmm. So here's Jesus. And we're going to be in Mark 12 here. Um, but you must know who you're dealing with. Everywhere you go uh, is a mission field, by the way. And uh, But every missionary or every Christian that, that goes out there somewhere to serve the Lord in, in just pretty much any capacity. Um, it, it, as you go, um, you go out as Christians and you're going to encounter opposition, right? You're going to come against those that oppose you. They're going to oppose you and they're going to oppose your God, right? They are people who are fooled. They are deceived. Okay, they're blind, they're deaf to the truth. They can't see it, they can't hear it, they don't get it. Okay, Satan has blinded their eyes and 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 stopped their ears. All right, and uh, uh, and so they're but they they they're gonna uh, they're gonna come at you. They're gonna come at you with all they've got. I mean, you talk about being passionate about something. These people are going to come with a vengeance, and literally, that's. Basically, what they're after is vengeance. Okay, uh, they think that they're right. Okay, they think that they have all the answers, that they know the truth, and they will stand aggressively and relentlessly against anyone who threatens their beliefs or ambitions. All right, and so. Uh, Jesus was right when he said, search the scriptures, for in them you think you have eternal life, all right? You must know where the source of truth is. That's the word of God. And then you need to search the scriptures. That is the truth, okay? That is the source, all right, uh, is the word of God. And uh, But we need to have people, we need to have Christians who will be willing to search the scriptures, um, you know, to know the truth and find what what the truth is because these people uh these enemies these foes these opponents are going to come at you aggressively and relentlessly they 
relentlessly. They are not going to stop. Okay. Now Jesus encountered um, uh, four main groups. Okay, or parties um, uh, of people. They were uh, uh, is like the Democratic Party and the Republican Party. Okay, they're they're ones that oppose each other because they disagree in just about everything, and uh, uh, or they stand on certain things and and, and they're opposed to people who uh, you know the uh, people who don't stand with them or don't agree with them. Okay, now these groups are these four main groups are the Pharisees, the Herodians, the Sadducees, and the scribes. Okay, we're going to talk about them tonight uh, and talk about the people. Uh, that Jesus had to deal with. And so you must know who you're dealing with if you're going to win the battle, all right? If you're going to win against uh, the, these guys that are coming at you with all they've got, okay? These, these groups basically are religious or political parties, okay? And they're mostly opposed to each other. They, they, they don't like each other. Right? They're like church denominations, you know, that don't agree in doctrine and they don't, you know, hang out together and, and they don't care for each other and they oppose each other's beliefs and that kind of thing. And uh, uh, but ex they, they oppose each other. They're against each other. Except for one time, it's when they're dealing with Christ. Then some of these groups at times come together and unite against Jesus Christ. Jesus came with the truth in a new light. And that totally upset their beliefs and their ambitions. Okay, it totally threatened uh, these people. Now, a note here, we enter a world of lies, deceit, and proud traditions. Bring in the truth. Okay, and it will stir up emotions and actions. All right, people get stirred up when you mess with what they believe, what they stand on, what they base their life on. Okay, and that's what we're doing. People are lost and dying and on their way to hell, and they're blind and, and deaf to it, and they don't know it, and they don't see it. Somebody's got to reach them. Somebody's got to convince them. But when we come to them and we try to give them the truth, they're going to say, why is your truth any better than my truth? They're going to say, I know the truth. I've got mine, and, and it's against that, and you're wrong, and I'm right. And you're going to get so much opposition. So when you when you enter this world of, uh, of lies and everything, it, it's, it's, it's not going to be easy. To carry the name of Christ with honor and boldness is to suffer persecution. You know, 2 Timothy 3.12, Yea, and all that live shall live godly in Christ Jesus shall suffer persecution. If you're going to live godly and stand for God and the truth and his righteousness, you're going to suffer persecution. So, you need to know that there are personal enemies. There are going to be people that come against you personally. In this story and in, in this lesson here, Christ had these people who were plotting and planning secretly and getting together and and planning how they were going to bring him down. Okay, uh, while he was resting or working or doing his thing, they were busy plotting and planning how they were going to bring him down. And their their goal was to kill him. Right, and so uh, and so they he had personal enemies, and and that's who these people were. And you you're going to have personal enemies. Okay, and they're going to be there to attack and destroy you. They're going to be there to attack and destroy your beliefs, your reputation, your life. They want to take you down. They want to wipe you out. They, they're going to want to get rid of you and stop you from doing what you're doing or saying what you're saying or being what you're being. So you better learn who they are. You better learn what they believe, where they're wrong, and how to deal with them. All right, another note here. Do you know for sure that you're right in what you believe? It doesn't do much good to go proving somebody else wrong when you're wrong yourself. Do you know you're right? Do you know for sure you've found the truth and that you're standing on the right thing? 
Okay, now that's a good question to ask. You need to ask and think about uh, that kind of thing. Okay, now the best way to detect a counterfeit is to know the real deal, is to know what real money is. If you're going to detect counterfeit money, you need to study the real deal so you know it so well, you'll know anything that's a counterfeit. All right. And so the best way to, to stand uh, against error, okay, is to know the truth. Know what the scriptures say. All right. And let me say this. You shall know the truth and the truth shall make you free. Okay. You want to be free? Find the truth. You say, I'm not sure if I've got the truth yet or not. Well, that verse Tells it all. Uh, if you're not free, you, excuse me, you haven't found the truth. If it doesn't, if it doesn't make you free, it isn't. Uh, excuse me, it isn't the truth. Whether it be in any doctrine, or religion, or 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 whatever, if it doesn't make you free, and then, then it binds you. It's got some falsehood in there somewhere, All right? But once you know the truth, you're going to be free. So you see, <clears throat> you see why you must search the scriptures for yourself. Don't just go on what the preacher says. Don't just go on what others tell you. Don't just go on what you were taught, what your parents brought you up as, uh, or whatever. You say, it'd be disrespectful to my parents, you know, if I didn't listen or, or believe and, and stand on what they taught me. It would be disrespectful to God if you die and go to hell and don't believe what he says. Amen. Okay? You're not going against your parents. You're going to find the truth, and you need to search it out for yourself. You won't search scriptures if you don't know that they're the source of truth, and you won't find truth and answers if you aren't willing to search the scriptures. Okay? So, who are the wolves? Do you know who the wolves are out there? Those enemies that are opposing God and you? Who are the sheep? Who are the real ones that are true Christians? Who are the wolves in sheep's clothing? Can you spot them? You need to search and study the scriptures for the truth to learn who you're up against and how to deal with them. Okay? Now, so remember, Jesus said, search the scriptures, for in them you think you have eternal life, All right? The Jews are the first people I want to talk about. The Jews thought they had eternal life, All right? And I forgot that I forgot to write down uh, the scripture here, uh, but in John chapter 5, uh, you can look through there if you want to. It talked about how the Jews... Um, uh, you know, questioned him and asked him, and and they had these these problems with Jesus, and uh, uh, the Jew, it said the Jews themselves. Okay, and so I looked that up. Now the the other four groups are the main groups we're going to talk about here in a little bit, but I wanted to point out the Jews. The Jews, they were God's chosen people. Okay, with thousands of years of history and heritage as God's chosen people. All right. They thought, here they are in Jesus' time, and they thought they had eternal life. They thought they knew the scriptures. The scriptures were theirs. It was given to them, nobody else. Who were these Jews? Who were they? What, what, what was going on here at this time? They were Jesus' own people. He came into his own, and his own received him not. They had the same language that he had. They had the same culture that he had. They, they had the same everything that he had. He was born amongst them and grew up amongst them. They were his people. They weren't some foreign mission field that you had to learn a different language and learn the culture and get to know them and figure out how to reach them. They were the same people. Yet they couldn't understand each other. Jesus spoke and they couldn't understand what he's saying. They spoke and, and it was all, it was different, different stuff. Right? They spoke the law. Jesus spoke spirit and truth of the law. See, they spoke and told what it said or the letter of the law. All right? How did Jesus handle these people, the Jews? They didn't understand him. They didn't get it. And it's because if they weren't saved, 
They didn't have the same spirit. And so the word of God, even the Old Testament law, it didn't make sense because they didn't, they didn't get the truth in it. So Jesus, how did he handle them? He handled them with love and patience. He came to save them. You don't save people. You don't get people saved by abusing them. He taught them starting where they were and patiently led them to where they needed to be. Okay? How do you treat and handle your own people? How do you treat and handle your own family? Do you come at them with the scriptures and beat them over the head with it and force them to get it? <laughs> or do you love them enough to say, I'm going to keep at it and stay with it and be patient and kind and gentle because I'm going to do whatever I can to get them saved. Otherwise, they're going to go to hell. How do you handle them? The Jews thought they had eternal life, but they most of them really didn't. Okay. Now, the next people is... The Pharisees. Pharisees thought they had eternal life. Look in Mark chapter 12, verse 13. It says, And they send unto him certain of the Pharisees and of the Herodians to catch him in his words. Okay? The Pharisees, uh, they thought they had eternal life. Wh who were these people? Well, they believed that the law of God, okay, the law that God gave Moses was twofold. Right? It consisted, uh, they believe it consisted of the written law, okay, the word of God that uh, Moses had written down and all that. And they believe it contained the oral law. Okay? The oral law was the things that were added to it to supposedly clarify it or, or uh, put it in more detail. And uh, uh, this was the teachings of, Okay, uh, so in other words, they believe the teachings of the prophets, Moses and the prophets, the Old Testament, and the oral traditions of the fathers. Okay, these ones who had added traditions to it, the Pharisees believed very strongly in the Old Testament law and the traditions. Okay, Pharisees believed the oral law was above the written law. Did you get that? They believe that the teachings of the fathers, the traditions of the fathers, was above and more to be believed on or whatever than the law itself, which was the word of God written by God. Okay? So they were constantly adding to it as needed. As time would go on and, and things would change, then they would need to change because the traditions or, or the, the, what they believed or wanted to believe called for it. So they would adjust them and they would change it and they would add some to it. This was the Pharisees. Okay? Uh, they believed, uh, they also were, they were very religious, but it was mostly all outward show. Okay? They, they were religious. Uh, meticulously going by the traditions and the law and doing everything it said outwardly uh, in order to get recognition and honor. You see, they were fair-eyed people. They look in the mirror and they go, my, I sure am fair. Okay? They thought they were something. We are God's leaders, elders, and religious ones. We are above everyone else. They wore the bells on the hems of their robe so that they could, uh, you know, make the noise so that everybody could see. And they blow a trumpet before they would pray, you know, uh, so that everyone could see that uh, uh, that they were going to pray in public and, and we could look at their wonderful prayers. And they just, they were fair, I see. You say they wanted honor and recognition, right? It was mostly outward show. They wanted to make proselytes. Proselyte uh, is when, uh, how many times? How many times have, have we spent time and money and effort and prayer with a tent meeting or a revival or something, uh, and, we, and we put in all this work and all this energy and, and all that trusting God, 
to finally reach some soul just to have some false or watered down church swoop in and take them from us and get them to join their church. So what happens? That's what a proselyte is. Someone who doesn't do the work, they wait till you do the work and then they swoop in and with their sweet talking, get them to go join their little religion or their little group. Proselyters. Okay, that's what the Pharisees were. They wanted to make disciples who would follow them as great leaders and teachers. Okay, see, they, they made disciples of for themselves. Okay, people that would follow them. Right? The, the Pharisees, they were devout in their religion and sincere, but sincerely misguided. Okay? They were uh, very meticulous and very uh, busy following these laws and these rules and out, outwardly and, uh, uh, and trying to live by those things. But they were misled, misguided, and messed up. They were very legalistic. Legalistic is law without grace. That's what it is. It's here's the law and you better do it. All right. Policeman says, he pulls you over and he says, the sign says 65 miles an hour. You were going 66. Why were you going so fast? Oh, it doesn't matter. Here's your ticket. You broke the law. That's what, that's what being legalistic is. Okay. <clears throat> The Sabbath law, and this is one, uh, Lord willing, I want to get on in a week or two, I want to talk about. The Sabbath law was the big one that they were against Jesus on, okay? Um, they, they uh, it, it's a good example. The Bible clearly told Israel in the Old Testament, do not work on the Sabbath day, okay? Uh, do not bear any burdens, uh, but rest and keep the Sabbath a holy day. Well, so work had to be defined. Carrying burdens had to be defined. What did it mean to work? What did it mean to carry a burden? What was the rules? What, what, what was considered as a burden? What was considered as, as work? <clears throat> All right. For example, here was what some of their rules were, their laws. One could get milk Okay, only enough, you could carry milk only enough for a, for a swallow to eat. Or I, I'm sorry, I guess a swallow uh, is not talking about the bird, uh, but is talking about to eat, eat themselves. Or maybe it's talking about the bird. Okay, let me, let me get past that one. One could only carry a spoon weighing no more than the weight of one fig. Okay? God said, you're not supposed to work on the Sabbath day. They said, we need to define what that means. That means if, you're, uh, if you carry something larger than a spoon that weighs no more than a fig, then you haven't done work. But anything bigger than that, you've done work on the Sabbath day and you're worthy of death. Okay? It was... Uh, it was the scribes and Pharisees who disagreed as to whether or not on the Sabbath a woman could wear a brooch or not. That's like a necklace or a pin or something. Okay? They, they couldn't agree on that. All right? Uh, uh, or, here's a good one. The scribes and Pharisees they had trouble uh, de de deciding if a mother could pick up her own child on the Sabbath. You see how ridiculous all this is? They were trying to define what work is and what a burden is. They said, Pharisees and the scribes disagreed about some of these things because the scribes were the one that wrote a bunch of these things and the Pharisees were a bunch of the, the ones that were up there that, that were enforcing them and, and helping, helping it to be. Okay, here's another one. A man... They, they argued they wasn't sure if a man should wear a wooden leg, if he had lost his leg or whatever, if he could wear his wooden leg because these are burdens, okay? Now, they adjusted these rules often and for various reasons, right? Pharisees, the Pharisees thought they had eternal life 
because they strictly adhered to the scriptures. All right. Now we talked about the Pharisees. We're going to go to the next ones. I'm going to try to get on through this tonight. The next ones, the next group Jesus had to deal with, he had to deal with the Jews, his own people. He wanted to win on the Lord. He had to deal with the Pharisees. Okay? They were fair, I see. And then, they, and then he had to deal with the Herodians. They thought they had it figured out. Mark uh, 12, verse 13 says, And they send unto him certain of the Pharisees and of the Herodians to catch him in his, in his work. Okay? Now, the Herodians were a Jewish, uh, a Jewish political party who believed in and supported Herod. Okay, Herod was basically the, the governor or ruler of the part of uh, the big nation of Rome, okay, the big world empire. Herod uh, had charge of the part that of most of the land of, of Israel, of the Jews. Okay, and, uh, and so uh, Herod, uh, the one who was alive during this time, it was his father who had tried to kill Jesus when he was a baby. Okay, he died right after that. And then uh, the, his son, who's on the throne now, okay, he was ruling now. So it was Rome, the, the Herodians, basically, they supported Rome. They believed Roman rule was the answer, particularly that Herod, uh, that of Herod who ruled, uh, you know, much of the land of the Jews, okay? Now, they likely leaned more toward Herod as being their messiah. Some, some people think that uh, they looked at Herod as, because uh, they were Jews, but they weren't in it for, for God and that kind of thing. They were in it for government. You know, some people are big government people, more government, all right? And uh, the, this was these people, and, and they leaned toward, um, uh, you know, these things. They wanted Herod uh, to be there, uh, to be the king or to be the, the, the Messiah or the king who would be the answer to all their problems. Now, the Herodians, were, appro were opposed to the Pharisees. The Herodians and the Pharisees didn't get along. They didn't agree with one another. It's because the Pharisees wanted the Jews to be free and rule themselves with their own king, while the Herodians wanted Rome to have all the power. Okay, hopefully that makes sense. I'm just studying this myself, so I still got to get a hold of it. Wherever you find politicians, you'll find people who devoutly support them no matter how corrupt they are, no matter what. Okay? And these Herodians, they were going to support the Herods or the, the, that rulership there, okay? Which was basically supporting Rome. So the Herodians hated Jesus because he claimed to be the Messiah, the king, and they said, we want Herod to be our king. We don't want this guy. The Pharisees hated Jesus because he claimed to be God and he broke the law. They said, we don't want him, you know, and they believed the Messiah was coming, and, uh, but it wasn't him. They weren't going to accept him, All right? Now, they thought, the Herodians thought they had the answers. They thought they could put their trust in man, okay, in a king on this earth, that government was the answer, excuse me. Uh, they were willing to be underhanded and, and unlawful and to do unlawful things to achieve their goals. Sounds like our politicians today and our leaders willing to do whatever, okay? But no man or authority or ambitions you can have or amount of laws can save your soul. It's not the answer. What about you? Will you compromise? what you know is right to get the greater good is it okay to compromise to get the greater good is it okay to do something sinful in order to get something good to happen will you do that or will you trust jesus the one who rubs you the wrong way who who teaches stuff that you don't want to believe or that you don't want to hear will you trust him no matter what he says and no matter what, because he is God. See, this is the problem. They thought they had the answers. They thought they had found, uh, figured it all out. But they weren't willing to put their trust in the one who was God. They wanted to put their trust in man. <clears throat> to trust Jesus is to trust and believe his word. You don't know 
what his word says unless you search the scriptures. Okay, so these these two people, the the Herodians and the Pharisees, get this, they're opposed to each other. They don't like each other. The Herodians want the want the Pharisees to to go down because they're wanting the Jews to have all the power. And the Jew the Pharisees want the Herodians to go down. Because the Herodians want Rome to have all the power, and they don't like each other. But in this one case, or this is one of the times that the Herodians and the Pharisees join together to figure out how to kill Jesus. Okay? They knew by this trick question in Mark 12, okay, verse 14, let's read it. It says, And when they were come, they say unto him, Master, we know that thou art true and carest for no man, for thou regardest not the person of men, but teachest the way of God in truth. Is it, is it lawful to give tribute to Caesar or not? They come to him with this and they butter him up, don't they? Boy, they say, we know you're, you're a man who, who respects nobody and their opinions and you're going to be fair and true and good and you're going to speak what is right, no matter what. Well, they butter him up. See, they knew by this trick question that if he answered and said, give tribute to Caesar, they knew they could provoke the common people against him because these local people were the Jews and they didn't like having to pay tribute to Caesar and be under his rule. So they knew if he answered, give tribute to Caesar, that they could turn the people against him. But they also knew if he said, don't give money to Caesar, don't give tribute to him that they could get Rome to turn against Jesus as teaching the people not to pay their taxes or give what was required. How did Jesus handle it? This is good. I, I like this. First, he knew their hypocrisy. Look in verse 15. They said, shall we give or shall we not give? That was the simple question, the trick question. But he knowing their hypocrisy, said unto them, Why tempt ye me? Bring me a penny, that I may see it. Okay? Right? He knew their hypocrisy and didn't get entangled with the politics. He didn't get entangled with arguing with people that he knew were only there to win an argument to cause problems. If you're a Christian, you ought to say, I want to learn not to get sucked into arguments with people. And I want to learn that it ain't about politics. It's about Jesus and heaven and eternity and forgiveness of sin. Okay. And so uh, he handled it very well. And so uh, the, the first thing was that, that uh, uh, he, he didn't get entangled in all that. Okay. If you will avoid lots of problems and keep the enemies from having, having ammunition against you, you'll learn to not argue foolish questions. That's what the world's coming going to come at you with, foolish questions. Did you know that? Dumb, ridiculous Bible questions just to get you arguing, just to trap you. Second thing he did was this. He took over the conversation and turned it around on them. Amen? As Christians, we ought to take over the conversation and turn it around and start asking them questions. Right? He used what they loved and believed in the most against them. Okay? Now listen, this takes knowing the scriptures and knowing your enemy. We need to search the scriptures to know them, and we need to know who our enemy is. Okay, the Pharisees aren't around today. The Herodians aren't around today. I don't have to deal with them. I've got to deal with the people in my life. Okay, now watch what Jesus did. Verse 15, he said, bring me a penny. Here's what he's saying. You got a penny? And they give him a penny. He says, he says this is your penny, right? Okay, it has your king on it, right? And it has your superscription on the one side on it right it's the it's the superscription from your king verse 16 says they brought it uh and they brought it and he saith unto them whose is this image and superscription and they say unto him caesar's so he says this is your penny it's the image of your leader your king and it's his superscription right that you believe in 
right? He's talking to the Herodians, right? Uh, mostly here. And, uh, and so he's looking at that. He took their own money from their own pocket with their own beliefs and their, the things they stand on the most. And he makes sure that it's theirs and that they believe that, okay? Uh, when someone uh, from a false religion asks you a question, it's a trick question, okay? To get you talking about some false beliefs. And you can bet that they've prepared and studied exactly to know exactly what they're going to say, okay? To get you into that conversation and to trap you into fooling you into believing the Bible says something uh, or whatever that uh, against what you believe. It's a trap. It's a trick. Right? You ought to take over the conversation. Right? We are Christians. Let us take control of the conversations. Let us know what we believe and why we believe it. Let us learn how to handle it right. Handle people right. I've got to hurry up. I'm going too long already. Okay. Third thing he did was this. He brought the real issue, okay, the real important thing to light. All right. The important thing wasn't should you give money to Caesar or not. Okay. The real, the greater issue he brought, the greater question into view. And that question is the question of God. Right. Do you know God? Right. Look in the next verse. He's answering, said unto them, Render to Caesar the things that are Caesar's, and to God the things that are God's. And they marveled at it. Right? What is the most important question? That you give money to Caesar or not? No. There's your eternal soul. That's the most important thing. What have I taught y'all about witnessing? What is the most important thing? <laughs> that person's salvation. It's not whether John the Baptist, you know, walked a certain way. It was, it's whether God is God and you know him or not. And Jesus took their question took control of the situation and the, the, the argument and turned it around on them and used their own beliefs against them to prove and to show them what was going on. And then he brought God into it and said, you need to give to God what, what you ought to give to God. Okay? Do you know God? What do you owe God? Better pay that even more so than paying Caesar what you owe him. I mean, to owe, we need to pay Caesar what we ought to pay him, but we, you better find and pay God what you ought to pay God. We need some Christians who will say, I know the truth. I know the true and living God who saved me and changed my life. I know it by those very scriptures, and I want to be someone who knows and studies, okay, the scriptures. I want to be someone who searches the scriptures and knows them and knows how to handle, handle people and handle things. The Herodians thought they had it figured out, okay, but they didn't, right? So we've covered the Jews, the Pharisees, the Herodians, okay? Next one is this, the Sadducees. Okay, they thought they had it figured out. Look in verse 18. Then came unto him the Sadducees, Sadducees, which say there is no resurrection. And they asked him, saying, they're getting ready to ask him their question. Okay, the Sadducees thought they had it figured out. Actually, they didn't know what they had figured out or whatever. Okay, uh, or they didn't know what they believed. Uh, but they were very dogmatic about standing up for whatever it was. They were like the atheists of today. Did you know that? The atheists today uh, who stand strong on their belief that there is no God. <laughs> All right? They, 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 I mean, they if, if they really didn't believe there was a God, they wouldn't argue about it. Wouldn't care what people thought. Wouldn't care what people said. Wouldn't care what the preacher said. They say, it doesn't bother me. No, I, don't, I just don't believe it. But yet they stand strong, and the Sadducees were a lot like that. 
Okay, now they were a little bit different. Okay, uh, and so uh, and the Sadducees, the the atheists, believe that there is no God, and they made a religion out of it. The Sadducees believed a little bit that there's a God. Okay, but they they believe that God does not commit evil, and uh, that God gave the law to Moses. Okay, so that we should just live by that and have a good life here. But once we die, there ain't nothing after that. See, they didn't believe. Uh, they didn't believe in heaven. They didn't believe in hell. Uh, no angels, no demons, no resurrection, no afterlife. They didn't believe in any of that stuff. Poor, miserable people. We call them Sadducees. You know why? Because they were, they were very sad. You see. Amen. We call them sad, you see, because they were sad, you see. Is that the kind of existence you want to live? I don't believe in anything. I don't stand on anything. And if I do stand on something, my stand is on the fact that I don't believe anything. <laughs> you know, and I don't believe there's an afterlife, even though my mind tells me there could be. Okay? I don't believe there's a God. I don't believe there's a heaven. I don't believe there's a hell. I don't, I don't believe in any of these things. Just live, we die, and that's it. That's the end. You know, Jesus walked around performing miracles. They didn't believe that either. They didn't believe in any supernatural powers or anything. Imagine other people were saying, wow, this guy's doing great things. And they were busy working to try to, to, to analyze it and uh, and figure out how they could explain it away. You see, they were they were sad. You see, you can see why they didn't get along with the Pharisees. The Pharisees believed in all those things: heaven and hell and angels and everything. Note, many Pharisees got saved in the Bible, according to the Bible records. As far as I know, and uh, I don't know for sure, but as far as I know. In the Bible is no recording, no record of any Sadducees getting saved, as far as I know. Sadducees were the upper class the, that controlled the two most important institutions of Jewish society, the temple and the Sanhedrin. Okay, The, San, the, the temple, we know the temple was the temple of God where the priests worked and the, the Levites and all that. The Sanhedrin was the governing body for both the religious and legal issues of the Jews. Okay? Uh, the leader of the Sanhedrin was a high priest who was given king-like authority and was almost always a Sadducee. So Sadducees were more interested in political power and wealth than anything else. Okay? That's why they hated Jesus. That's one of the reasons. They were religious insofar as it kept them rich and powerful. They got to, to be powerful in the temple and have all of this uh, influence and authority, and they got to be rich from it. Think about it. Okay? Here's the, here's the temple. Here's what it became in Jesus' time. Here were the the uh, the on the feast day or, or even on common days, a Jew would come to the temple and bring his little lamb, his little sheep, for a sacrifice to the temple. Here's this poor Jew who doesn't have hardly anything, and he comes uh, just a common person to come and and get the covering uh, the the bloodshed for his sins, okay. Uh, or whatever, and he comes and brings this little sheep, and he comes up to this temple, and here's these scribes in there, with their they got their business going. He brings this sheep, and it's a, it's as good of a sheep as he can have and find, and and that he's taken care of, and he brings it, and the Sadducee says, nope, mm -mm. that one's not good enough. It's it's uh, not not perfect. Okay, you're gonna have to buy one of these sheep from us. Okay, so the the man. Gets in his pocket and he's got to buy a sheep, you know, and uh, uh, and so he he comes out with some money and they say, oh no no no, that's the wrong currency. Uh, for a fee, we'll we'll change change that currency for you. And by the way, the cost of the sheep is probably two or three times more than what it's worth. 
So they do this and they rip this guy off and they do it. And it's a matter of, uh, it's, it's stealing, it's robbery, it's wicked, it's wrong. And they're doing it in the temple. Then a little while later, another fella comes along with a sheep and they say, no, that one's not good enough either. You have to buy this one. And it happens to be the one that they just stole from the previous guy. So Jesus, <laughs> Jesus was a threat to the Sadducees, okay? Because he didn't necessarily wait for them to come and attack him so much. He went and attacked them, <laughs> all right? Uh, uh, he was a threat to them because he exposed their dishonest, greedy, corrupt, so-called religion. Remember what he did two different times? He took him, made him a whip, and he went in the temple, and he ran them rascals out of there. He turned over the money tables and, and, and ran it all out of there. He disrupted their business at least for a day. Showed them that it was wicked and wrong. That's the one who the Sadducees were talking about. Okay? Now, <clears throat> they hated Jesus. Now look in Mark 12, verse 19 to 23. It says, Master, oh, Master, uh, so verse 18, then came unto him the Sadducees, which say there is no resurrection. And they asked him, saying, Master, Moses wrote unto us, if a, man, uh, if a man's brother die and leave his wife behind him and leave no children, that his brother should take his wife and raise up seed unto his brother. Now there were seven brethren, and the first took a wife, and dying left no seed. And the second took her and died, neither left he any seed. And the third likewise. And the seven had her and no and left no seed. Last of all, the woman died also. In the resurrection, here's their question. In the resurrection, therefore, uh, when they shall rise, whose wife shall she be of them? For the seven had her to wife. So they don't even believe in the resurrection but they're coming in and acting like they're not Sadducees and they're coming in and acting like they believe this stuff and they come with this question to trick Jesus, okay? <clears throat> they attack Jesus at his teaching, his doctrine, which opposed their doctrine, the resurrection, okay? If his doctrine was right and there is a resurrection, then what they believe must be wrong, and they ain't going to have that, all right? They knew, okay, they knew the scriptures more than anyone, yet they didn't really know them. You see, they studied the scriptures for their own agendas, for their own benefit, not to know the God of the scriptures. Jesus said, you do greatly err not knowing the scriptures. Verse 24. Jesus answering said unto him, Do ye not therefore err because ye know not the scriptures, neither the power of God? All right. So <clears throat> he said, you, you, you err. You make a mistake. You're wrong not knowing the scriptures. What a slap in the face that was to him. Then he preaches to them using their own topics. One who truly knows the scriptures and the mighty God of it, of them, is ready to preach the scriptures, preach to others. And that's what I want to challenge you on this point is, okay? Do you know the scriptures well enough that you're ready to preach it, right? They tried to prove there was no resurrection. He preaches the resurrection, angels, the afterlife, and all this stuff as being much more greater than even they could imagine or comprehend or that they understood from the Old Testament scriptures. Verse 25, 26, 27. For when they shall rise, Jesus said, uh, for when they shall rise from the dead, they neither marry nor are given in marriage, but are as the angels which are in heaven. And as touching the dead they that they rise, have you not read in the book of Moses how in the bush God spake unto him, saying, I am the God of Abraham, and the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob. He is not the God of the dead, but the God of the living. You do, you therefore do greatly err. You don't believe any of these things. And he preached to them, and he exposed their lies, and he showed them how they were wrong, and he proved that there has to be a God. There has to be a resurrection. There has to be something after this. <clears throat> Verse 
what he said was, and look in verse, uh, uh, as touching the dead, or, or verse 25 it says, for when they shall rise from the dead, they neither marry nor are given in marriage. They brought up this scripture, says they're going to be as the angels are in heaven. They brought up, up this Old Testament scripture uh, about marriage. Why? Because they believe all you get is down here in this world. Okay? And they're talking about living in this body and having the sensual pleasures of this life. And God even proves to them, Jesus even proves to them. That uh, you're, you're thinking of fleshly things, and when these are heavenly things that are so much greater than you can imagine. Okay? He said, you're concerned about your sensual pleasures. Let me ask you a question. Who's the unbelievers in your life? Are you ready to preach the truth to them? You got to study. You got to know the scriptures. I got to hurry. I can't believe it's going so fast. Okay. Last thing is this. Last last two points. Okay. And they're going to be quicker. Okay. There's the Jews. There's the Pharisees. There's the Herodians. There's the Sadducees. Now we come to the scribes. Okay. The scribes thought they had eternal life. No one was more in the scriptures than them. They were copiers of the scriptures. That's what they did, copy the scriptures. We're glad that they did that, by the way, because we still got the Old Testament, all right? Uh, they were teachers of the scriptures. They were interpreters of the Old Testament law, okay? They were some of the ones who added many meticulous traditions to the law, these scribes in this day, okay? Thus, most of them at that time became very proud and superior. I mean, by adding to Scripture at their own will, they in a way became the God who was speaking the Word. Okay? And of course, they were a group of special people. But look here in verse 28. It says, And one of the scribes came, and having heard them reasoning together and perceiving that he had answered them well, asked him, which is the first commandment of all? And Jesus answered him, the first of all commandments is, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God is one Lord. He talks about the, the great commandments. And the scribe, verse 32, said unto him, Well, Master, thou hast said the truth, for there is one God and there is none other but he. And to love him with all the heart, with all this understanding, with all the soul, and with all the strength and to love his neighbor as himself is more than all whole burnt offerings and sacrifices. Sounds like he's making some sense, ain't it? Okay, now <clears throat> I'll get back to that here in just a minute. This guy, I want you to, to, to think about it. Um, if I can find my place here, all right? Um, <laughs> I know, I, I skipped those. Uh, all right. Um, okay, so here he is. This guy, possibly, he was a scribe. He was one of the ones that had written the part, you know, he was working on, you know, doing some of that. And uh, it, it, I don't know for sure, but it's likely, it's possible that he was waiting in line to snare the Lord too. Here the Herodians had come and the Pharisees and the Sadducees come along and they all trying to trick him. Maybe this guy was waiting in line to do his part. But as he was waiting, he was watching and listening to how Jesus handled all the other ones. Okay? By the, by the time it was his turn, the Holy Spirit maybe was getting a hold of him. And how was he doing it? Through the proper use of the scriptures. The Sadducees that Jesus dealt with probably stubbornly stuck to their beliefs and went to hell, which they didn't even believe in. Did Jesus waste his time preaching to them? No. You know why? Because there was a scribe standing there watching. So let me just say this. Mom, Dad, are you wasting your time serving God? and studying the scriptures, and having your devotions with your kids? Is it a waste of time? Is it a waste of time that you witness to your family, and you love Jesus, and you live that life? No. Your kids are watching. 
and others are watching. And if you don't win some of them to the Lord, someone might get saved because they're watching and listening to you. And the better you can learn the scriptures and how to, to, to know what they say and to know the spirit of them and know what you believe and to know the God of the scriptures and to know how to use them and how to preach and how to teach and how to witness, and the better off you'll be in all ways how to combat these that oppose you. Now, the last point is this. There was one more enemy in this chapter. You won't, you won't see him in there. You won't find him in there. He's so subtle and sly and crafty that if you don't know your scriptures, you'll miss him altogether. And then you're in trouble. His name is Satan. Do you know this enemy? Are you aware of his devices? <clears throat> I'm not saying you should devote your time to studying about Satan and, and get obsessed with him. But, by George, you better know who he is and what he does and what his tricks are and what he's up to in your life. Okay? Now, the, in conclusion is this. I hope and pray that you'll take God's word seriously and search the scriptures for yourself. Don't just believe in what some man says. Okay, search for yourself. For in them you think you have eternal life. Do you know the scriptures? Okay, to not know the scriptures is to not find the truth. To not know the truth is to greatly err. Why? Because to think you have eternal life is quite possibly to not really have it. To think you know the scriptures is to not be prepared, if you do have eternal life, if you are saved, to think you know the scriptures is to not be prepared when Satan and his minions, his little puppets, okay, his disciples, when they come to destroy you. I hope and pray that you will learn to search the scriptures for yourself and find and know the answers yourself. Let's pray. Our dear Father, we come to you tonight and we thank you for the word of God. I pray that it would go out and accomplish its purpose and do a work in people's hearts and lives. Help us, Lord, to realize we have enemies out there that are out to destroy us and that want to tear down the word of God and, uh, and the testimony of the very one that we know and love, and that's you. We just pray that you'd help us, God, be better and stronger Christians in this wicked world. Go with us now tonight, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, want to remind you, if you have any prayer requests, uh, send those. I, I'd encourage you to post them on my timeline. That way everybody else can see them too. And uh, But we'll pray for those and uh, uh, if we need to. So until uh, then, it's good being here and seeing y'all. I hope a bunch more of you on there than I can see. And so <laughs> we'll, we'll see you later. Uh, Pastor Randy, signing off.